Okay, everybody, welcome to the One Thing webinar. I'm so excited to talk about the one thing to discover your calling um, with Jeff Goins. Um, it's really going to be an exciting show. This lines up so perfectly with the message of the one thing. Um, when people say, what, what was the one thing we wanted people to do when they put the book down? We want to ask that question. What's my one thing? And a lot of people think of that purely in the context of their profession. Um, but there's a bigger level too. Like, why am I here? Right? So we explored this. We were almost five years in our research. We spent a lot of that pouring over what wisdom we could glean from other wise people. Um, we went down that journey. And I can tell you, having read a lot of these books, that um, the research that Jeff did, the interviews that he did, the stories that he tells in The Art of Work are really terrific. Um, he really approached this like a student, a journalist. Um, he covered it from all angles, and he gives us some really practical stuff. So quick preview of who's going to be on the show um, and kind of what we're looking at today. If this is your first time, um, I'm going to quickly touch on what's the big idea of the one thing, because that's going to come out. That's why we're here. And I know that roughly 30% of you um, have not experienced the book, but I'm going to do that quick to honor the 70% who have experienced the book. Um, throughout the show, right, once I do that, I'm going to interview Jeff. We're going to cover three big points on how you can discover your calling. Um, we'll hit that as hard as we can. And then the last 15 minutes or so will be dedicated to a Q&A. So if you use the questions toolbar, you can type your questions in there. Our team will be flagging those so that at the end of the hour, we can come to them and knock them out in the order they came. So as you think of a question, go ahead and type it in. Don't wait till the end. Just put it in there. You'll actually be higher up in the queue. That's great for you if you want to hear your specific answer. Um, at any time, do that. So use the questions. You can also give us feedback. So Jeff, let's tell you a little bit about Jeff. My friend, Clark Nowlin, um, who works with us here, who's done podcasting, he actually helped produce Jeff Goins' podcast, which is terrific. Um, and you can go to goinswriter.com if you want to explore that and more of his stuff. But Jeff wrote this book, um, The Art of Work, and I was so happy to get this introduction. He's a full-time author now, but what's great as he tells his story, he didn't start out on that path. This was a discovery for him as on his journey to find his calling. He's lived this material. His book was a national bestseller, and now having transitioned from another life, right, to his current one, he's a full-time blogger, speaker, and entrepreneur. Um, he's from Chicago, but he's now based out of Nashville. Um, he loves helping writers. He loves helping creative entrepreneurs chase their dreams. I know a lot of you, that description fits you perfectly. Um, he's won um, awards for his blog, goinswriter.com. We've had over 4 million visitors. And I can tell you, someone who plays a rudimentary version of that game, that's huge. That's a lot of people coming back. That means there's great content. It's been featured in the Washington Post, USA Today, Entrepreneur, Forbes, and Psychology Today. Um, so if you didn't think he was cool, hopefully now you get it. This guy has been there, done that, and he's actually written one of the best books on the subject of finding your calling, and I've read quite a few. Um, what got my attention um, is a fact that he shares pretty early in the book and that I've studied these engagement surveys they do for people at work. And he looked at engagement, and he looked at it through a different lens than I've seen. If you look at those figures, one way to look at that, and it's absolutely valid, is only 13% of people are truly happy with their job. That immediately tells you that 87% are less than satisfied. And I know a lot of people, I've talked to them, right? They've come in, they're interviewing for a job. They're looking for that place that will make them fulfilled. I mean, I had one lady tell me, you know, that she would cry in the parking lot before she would walk into the office and that she needed a change. And I don't think that is a, that person was alone. I actually have heard that many times. So today, hopefully we'll get a little closer to you knowing what path you should be on, or maybe that you're actually on the right path and give you more confidence in that so that you can really get more joy and fulfillment out of what you do. So really quickly, I want to hit on a couple of points from the one thing. The book, if you look at this, this is an iceberg, by the way, out of context. But if you think about an iceberg, you know, they always say one ninth of an iceberg is above water. And in our metaphor, that's the productivity of a person. You see someone who's highly productive. That's what we see. 
And frankly, that's mostly what we talk about when we talk about this book, how to be more productive, how to focus on your one thing and get it done day in and day out. But what lies underneath that, what supports that so we can actually rise up is a sense of priority, right? When you know your priorities and you're always working on them, by default, you are at your most productive. But you go deeper than that. What the real foundation of everything, when you look at the best companies and the people who make the most significant contributions, underlying it all is a sense of purpose. They understand what their business is about and what its purpose is or what their own is. And it may not be a perfectly articulated mission statement, but it could be something that gives them real direction. Because if you know where you're going, right, if you know ultimately where you want to go, even if it's just a general direction, that immediately allows you to say no to the other stuff. It gives you priority. And again, operating in priority makes you very productive because you're doing your most important work. You're doing your most important decisions. So you can see how those three interact. Purpose leads to priority, which leads to productivity. So today, that's what we're going to be talking about, folks. Purpose, what underlies it all. If we're really going to live a great life and have no regrets, that's what it's about. Um, a story that I like to share when I tell the book, because this is relating to me and my interaction with this material. There's a great book by Jonathan Haidt. And it's called The Happiness Hypothesis. And he lays out this metaphor for us, the elephant and the rider. And it's about purpose and it's about calling. And he says, if you've ever seen National Geographic, one of those TV shows where you have the small Asian boy riding on the giant Asian elephant, he asks the question, is there anything that 60 pound kid could do to stop that two ton elephant? If that elephant decides it doesn't want to go down the path, it wants to go somewhere else. And the obvious answer is, there's nothing that kid can do. He's too small. He's just somebody who is along for the ride. And the moment you understand that, Jonathan, the author, reveals, like, listen, in life, your head, right, your, your brain is the writer. It, you think that's what's in charge. But in all honesty, the elephant is your heart. And the elephant was always in charge. It was just agreeing to go where you thought you wanted to go. When I first heard that, I was like incredibly discouraged because I thought, man, I have no idea where I'm going. Um, I really had some really big unanswered questions in my life. And if the writer was clueless, how could the elephant be? And when we parse that through, what well, we realized if the elephant has always been in charge and the elephant always knows the truth, then the elephant has been leading us somewhere. And I was encouraged to look backwards, to look for clues. And Jeff, and I'm going to ask him to share this. He's got a kind of a process for actually doing this to see where the breadcrumbs have been leading you all along. And the moment I looked backwards, I had a lot of reassurance. You can't be that far off course if the elephant has actually been walking you down this path, but you just haven't been paying attention. The end of the day, what's at stake? Why do we even care about this? Well, Gary had ultimately said that one of the things he wanted for people was a life of no regrets. That's one of the reasons he was driven to write this book. And we went and studied this. And there's a lady named Bronnie Ware. Um, she was a hospice nurse. So she worked with lots and lots of people in their last hours. And she wrote a book about what they often stated was their greatest regret. And if you count down the top five regrets of the dying, which is also the name of the book, um, number five was, I wish I'd let myself be happier, right? Happiness was a choice. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. But the number one was I wished I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. And that's what we're here, right? People maybe heard their calling, realized they hadn't been listening early enough in their life. And this was probably the deepest regret they felt. So one, congratulations for being here today. This is an important conversation. I hope you walk away with, if not more confidence or enlightenment about what you are and where you're going, then hopefully some concrete things that you can do. I know that Jeff has actual exercises in his book, and I'm going to try to hit him up to kind of give us instructions. If we're really lost, what can we do to figure out where this elephant thing has been leading us this long? So with all of that in mind, I want to welcome Jeff on Jeff, can you hear me? Let me know if you can hear me. Yep, I'm here. 
Jeff, welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to join us. And uh, I hope I didn't lay that on too thick, but it was absolutely sincere. I feel like this is such a big topic for people to address. Yeah. No, I'm honored. Thanks, Jay. I love the one thing. I love this community. I am a uh, fan of uh, what you, uh, the movement that you know you and Gary have created, a part of it, and honored to be here today. So thank you. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about um, this book, right? You share the story of being in that seminar. Can you recreate a little bit about how you kind of had your, I, I'm going to call it awakening for mm -hmm. lack of a better word. Can you give us a little bit about the origins? Was that the origin for this book or is that just a story you told in the book? Yeah, so, yeah, so I tell this story about how I became a writer and um you're right in, in what you mentioned earlier, Jay, which is that this process sort of surprised me. Writing a book, is, as you know, Jay, is a journey in itself. And so um, I kept having friends uh, and acquaintances and uh, some of the readers of my blog asking me this question over and over and over again, which was, you know, how did you do this thing? Which was, I quit my job, I became a writer. And I was able to support myself and my family, start a business, and have been doing that for this, you know the past several years, and everything continues to go even better and better every year. And so I sat down to write this book, and I wrote like these seven principles for how to live you know, a successful life and find your calling. And at the end of writing that book, I realized that all those seven things that I wrote in there, those seven principles, weren't true. They were the things that we say or that we hear someone say uh, when they achieve a certain level of success that most of us want to acquire. Uh, things like you need to have a vision and just go do it. You need to have a plan. You need to know what you want in advance. And um, so I, I kind of <laughs> read this book and I wrote this book that I didn't believe. And so what I did next, and this will come back to the question about the seminar, is I just, like you said, I kind of turned into a journalist and I just started asking people, hundreds of people who had found their calling, who had found their life's work, not superstars, regular, ordinary people, uh, yet whose lives were extraordinary in some way, who were doing incredible work that they found meaningful and was creating value in the world, and they were th those people who weren't going to die with uh, regrets of how they spent their life. And what I was surprised by, uh, and then it started to resonate with me, I started to discover some of these, uh, some themes in each of these stories, and it resonated with my own story. But the biggest thing was this, that for each person in some small or large way, their calling surprised them. And what I realized about the, you know, writing that book with these seven principles was, was that they were half true. And, and I went back and took these stories and took all this deeper research that I did on uh, motivation and careers and just what it takes to do meaningful work and live a, a, a meaningful life um, and, and whether or not that's attainable for everybody. Uh, it, it, I realized that we tend to sanitize our stories once we've achieved some sort of success. And we, we don't tell people what we've done, we tell them what we wish we would have done or what it looks like 10 or 20 or 50 years after the fact. And so when I sat down to write this book, rewrite it actually and write it more honestly, I told that story about sitting in a seminar um, asking uh, I was sitting in the seminar. I started going to this uh, a bunch of conferences in my late 20s because I felt this itch that I couldn't scratch. Something was missing in my life, and I was at this conference. I was supposed to teach you uh, how to find your dream, and uh, the speaker said, "Hey, um, most of you uh, filled out this survey, right? And you took the survey before you went to this conference where you're supposed to like." like figure out how to take the appropriate steps to uh, find or build your own dream job. And um, it was basically like an entrepreneurship conference for people who wanted to go do something new and, and find a way for their skills and passions to um, make a difference in the world. And uh, I was, I was I, I, it, when I took that survey, it was like, I know what I want to do, I have an idea what I want to do, or I have no idea. And I was in the, I have no idea. And so um, you were supposed to put on your name tag, like, what your dream was. 
and I put something ridiculous like storytelling Sherpa or something. Like I just wanted people to not ask me that question. <laughs> I was so scared to name my dream because I felt like I was going to be committed to it. I had no idea, and this is the thing that I think most people, when you ask them, "What's your passion? What's you know? What's your calling?" Most people that I talk to don't have a clear idea of what that is. And so here's what the speaker said. Uh, I was one of those people. He said, um, "He said, you know, you guys have all taken the survey, and here's the thing: most of you said that you don't know what what your dream is." And I felt this sigh of relief. I realized, oh, like I'm not the only one. I had all this shame, you know. I was like shrinking in my chair. And he said, here's the second thing. You're not telling the truth. He said, here's what I believe. I believe that you have an idea of what your dream is. You're just afraid to admit it. And as soon as he said that, a word popped into my mind. I opened my notebook, and I wrote it down. And that word was writer. And so what, how I interpret that and what I've come to believe since then, this is how I start the book, is um, – the process of finding your calling begins with the concept of awareness, and you have to have an idea. That you know, when you hear somebody say you've got to have a vision for your life, that's true, but most of us, a lot of us, I mean, that's intimidating. And what I believe is that you do have some idea, and if you don't have a great idea, you can deepen your awareness. If you do, you can you know deepen it even further. So wherever you're at on this spectrum, there's ways to gain greater clarity. But you have some idea of what you're meant to do with your life. Uh, you, like me, just may be afraid to admit it because there's commitment and there's responsibility associated uh, with that. But I believe that you can't take a step forward until we shore up this concept of awareness. How can we figure out exactly uh, what we're meant to do? And that's a process, as you talked about with the breadcrumbs. It's not of, about looking forward. It's really about looking backward. Finding your dream is not an act of discovery. It's an act of recovery. You know, I love that. Um, I just got to interrupt your flow because I feel like you could actually just take it for the next 20 minutes. I mean, with the, the, the way you tell your stories and everything so mm -hmm. seamlessly. But one thing I just want to highlight, I love the honesty that it was a messy process. And I think totally. so many people see success or see someone, oh, you heard about that Jeff guy. He's living his dream. And it's always relayed, and it's usually because of maybe we're impatient or just the medium. It's always compacted, and, and all the mistakes are cut out. And I don't even think it's people protecting their egos. I just think that's the way we want the hero's journey to sound, even though that's not the way it really shows up in life. That success, and I, I love my partner, Gary. I've heard him go on stage and talk about really tough things happening in his life, very honestly. And I remember him coming off stage. And I said, why do you do that? And he goes, because there's people out there whose lives are messy. And I never, ever want them to be sitting there thinking he's successful because he doesn't have to go through this. The real path is we all have to go through that. It is a little bit messy, but it's getting to the other side is where the reward is. So thank you for being transparent, right? That you felt like an imposter yeah. in that room. Um, and you know, getting us to this sense of awareness. And I'm, I'm going to pull up the three bullet points we talked about because I feel like we're about to talk about listening to your life. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, that way people can follow along. Out of the seven in the book, we kind of pulled these three out. So the first step, the awareness is listening to your life. What, what do you mean by that statement? So, uh, Jay, I want to begin with the way I define a calling because somebody might be going, well, what does this mean? And by the way, calling, purpose, even thinking of it as your life's work, these are terms that I more or less use interchangeably, but I tend to settle on the word calling. Um, and traditionally, that's what a vocation meant, vocare. The word uh, vocation comes from a Latin word, which literally means to call. And if you look at the hero's journey stru structure, which you mentioned, um, People don't completely understand that process because the way the hero's journey process works is you start out with some hero like Luke Skywalker. I'll pick my favorite, you know, hero's journey epic. And he has no idea of, of the adventure that he is in store for. You know, when, he, when you start out, he's this farmer on this desert planet and his life is kind of boring. Uh, or you think about like the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy, you know, out in Kansas. 
all of our stories begin in some place that isn't that exciting, isn't some sort of ideal setting. All great adventures begin in ordinary places. And so when you think about finding your calling, discovering your life's work, what thing could be more important? And if you feel, as many people do, as I have felt and often feel, that my life is just kind of ordinary. How could something extraordinary come from this? Or this idea of finding your purpose, like that's something reserved for special people. I don't believe that's true. I think that a calling is not a carefully crafted plan. Really, it's what's left when the plan for your life goes horribly wrong. And at given moments, all of our plans tend to fall apart. And so if you thought you would do one thing and you ended up doing something else, I hope that this encourages you to take heart and realize that um, you can be making intentional steps towards your life's purpose, but it is totally, totally messy. And the big lesson that I learned from writing this book from meeting these people who helped give me clarity on my own process it is that um, we all get an opportunity to live an extraordinary life but what makes a life extraordinary aren't the chances we get but what we do with them and the process begins with this idea of not a plan but of listening to your life of looking backward not forward uh, so what do I mean by that well one person well, that I met, I, interrupt? I just want to yeah, highlight people are taking sure. notes like I if I could just just be a full student and not someone who's helping through this I would be writing so many notes but yeah. all great adventures start in an ordinary place and I love that because a lot of people wonder if they have this notion that they might be meant for more that they're worthy of it so a simple farmer on Tatooine or wherever it was, Luke, you know, Skywalker was, that's everybody. We're all that person to begin with. You don't have to have special circumstances to have the great adventure. And mm -hmm. it's what's left when everything else is taken away. Um, that, that, it's, that to me implies that it's something that's at the core of who we are. It's not something that's on the outside, which again, leads me down this path of, discovery. But I, those two statements stood out for me out of what you just said. So I wanted to highlight them again for folks if they maybe got distracted. Um, yeah. It's from the ordinary that the extraordinary begins and that mm -hmm. your purpose isn't this plan. It's what's left when everything else is stripped away. Because I think those are, those are passages that I underlined in the book and I was mm -hmm. writing furiously in the margins. Yeah. Yeah. And I learned that this idea that the extraordinary comes from the ordinary from a five year old boy who gets a brain tumor and the doctors give him five years to live. And at the one year anniversary of of the this um, he gets a brain tumor, uh, the doctors remove it and um, it's a pretty invasive surgery. So it ends up leaving him blind, uh, paralyzed, mute. Uh, and he still has cancer. And the doctors say, you've got five years to live. And so a year later, he, the, his, the boy's name is Garrett, and the father's name is Eric. They finish a triathlon together with the, the father pushing the son across the finish line in a wheelchair. And then they do some more you know, uh, clinical treatments, and uh, they end up doing it again the next year, and then the next year, and then the next year. They do this 12 times. 12 years in a row and then Garrett does a triathlon on his own because uh, some of his mobility comes back, some of his eyesight comes back, he's still legally blind. Then he goes on to climb Machu Picchu. Uh, then he goes on to become an Eagle Scout and he volunteers his time today, many, many years after that five-year death sentence that the doctors gave him. Uh, he, he volunteers his time at Wounded Warriors, which is a charity that helps war veterans. and. When I when I talked to Garrett, I got to talk to this 19-year-old boy, and I said, what do you want more than anything? He said, I want a girlfriend. <laughs> and I have to contractually share that with the world. Um, so if you know any <laughs> young ladies out there looking for a, a hero. No, uh, you know, he, he, he did say that. He said, let people know that I'm looking for a girlfriend. And then secondly, like, like he, he doesn't think that, the things that happened to him were good, but he, inspired by his dad, really, because he was a five-year-old boy when all this happened, uh, they realized that they did not get to control how much time they had left on the clock, but they did get to control what they did with that time. And so they decided they were going to use every moment as if it counted. And here's Garrett, who in 13 years has lived more life than 
many of us would hope to live in 50 or 75 years. And again, there's that idea, what makes life extraordinary aren't the chances we get. What a bum rap. I mean, what's just a horrible, like, there's nothing great about the chance that Garrett got or didn't get, but instead he chose to do something extraordinary uh, with it. So the hero's journey begins with the call. And so where does your calling come from? Uh, well, uh, what I love about great stories is they start in ordinary places and they take you somewhere extraordinary and the process is surprising to the hero. So listening to your life is really, um, it's a series of questions that you ask yourself. It's about looking uh, back or not necessarily about looking forward. So when I went to that seminar at 27 years old and I wrote the word writer down, that was an epiphany to me. We do have these moments of discovery where, you know, a light kind of turns on. And so I took that piece of paper home that night to my wife and I said, babe, you can, you're not going to believe it. Like, this is amazing. Um, I am supposed to be a writer. Like, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. I was a marketing director at a nonprofit. I had a pretty good job. I, I liked it. Um, but I just, I had that itch that a lot of people have. Didn't hate my job. Didn't have a terrible boss. And actually, I think this is the most dangerous place to be. If you hate your job, that's really good news because you know something has to change. As Jay mentioned earlier, if you're sitting in the um, uh, parking lot crying, uh, you know, like that has to change. You can't do that every day. But if you're comfortable, as I was, that's a really dangerous place to be because you can stay stuck there coasting for the rest of your career, if not the rest of your life. And I anticipated that five years, just five years into this job, where I realized I'm like, I'm probably not going to screw something up so badly that I'm going to get fired. And if I just play my cards right, I'll keep getting a raise every year, which was happening, and I'll keep, um, you know, getting a little bit more responsibility. And I could do this for the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And that scared me because I would have been playing it safe. So when I realized I was supposed to be a writer, that was a big deal. I run home. I, I show my wife the my wife the notebook, and I say, "Look, babe, I'm supposed to be a writer." And she goes, "Are you kidding me? I've been telling you that for five years. You just now figured that out." And I was like, "Oh, okay." And <laughs> <laughs> they always others always seem to notice these things before we do. I, I get that totally. I know. Yeah, so what I realized is this epiphany that happened uh, was really a gradual process. I've been going to conferences, I've been reading books, I had been writing every Saturday afternoon on the side. It was just something that I was afraid to admit to myself. And other people will notice this thing in you sometimes before you even admit it yourself. And so I had this itch, I started scratching it. And uh, I, I read this book by a guy named Parker Palmer uh, called Let Your Life Speak, a great book on the subject. If, you want, if you're looking for a book to read, you know, The Art of Work covers some of this, um, but another book on the subject is Let Your Life Speak. In that book, Palmer says this, before I can tell my life what I want to do with it, I need to listen to my life telling me who I am. Uh, Thomas Merton says it like this, that many of us will uh, climb the ladder of success in life, what we think we want, only to realize that the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. If you don't want your ladder to be leaning against the wrong wall at the end of your life, you need to listen to your life. And so to get practical, what does that look like? Um, I think it means asking yourself three important questions. The first question is a question of passion. What do I love? So Every uh, Saturday afternoon, I mentioned I would, I would open up my laptop and I would write, you know, thousands of words just for fun because I loved doing it. When I started listening to my life, and what that meant was I just started remembering things that I had always done. And it doesn't mean that your past dictates your future, but it should inform it. And so I actually drew this line, and, and if you have a piece of paper in front of you, I would recommend that you do this and you think about it a little bit. This is a contemplative process. Um, so you know, it requires a little bit of uh, meditation and just thought and time, but draw a little lifeline and you know, draw it 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, how many you know, years you've lived, and then just start plotting significant moments that stand out to you when you did something that made you feel alive. I'm not one of those people that, that it's just going to tell you to go chase your passion, um, 
but I do not think a calling is a passionless pursuit. I think that it can be difficult, it, re it can require practice and hard work, but it should be something that invigorates you and gives you life. And so that's the first question, what do I love? Spend some time asking yourself, what are things that I've done that have made me come alive? Uh, it may be, as it was for me, it's not like since you were two years old you wanted to write, but it was this thing, it was this theme woven throughout everything, which was the case for writing with me. When I was a kid, I liked to draw, so I made these little homemade comic books. And when I was a teenager, my dad taught me how to play the guitar, and so I joined a band, and I was the lead singer for the band, and I wrote a bunch of songs. My favorite part was writing those songs. When I was in college, I was a Spanish major. My favorite part of studying Spanish was understanding the way the grammar worked, and writing these these papers in another language and woven throughout all these disparate experiences was a theme writing writing was the thing that I escaped to when I was stressed or afraid or just needed to process so question one what do I love question two is a question of skill what am I good at and and you may need some help from other people uh, Derek Siver says it like this and I love this what's obvious to you is amazing to others What's something that you're really good at that not everybody is really good at? What is your unique ability? What is the thing that you do better, not than everybody in the world, but better than most, better than 10 friends? And you might need to go text or email 10 friends and say, what's something that comes naturally to me that doesn't necessarily come naturally to other people? That's an important piece of it. And then the final piece is demand. What is the thing that you have, and I believe that a calling is not just a passion. It is the thing that you do well and that makes you come alive and that meets a real need and demand uh, in the world. Frederick Buechner says that your calling is the place where uh, your deepest joy meets the world's deepest need. And so when we listen to our lives, we're not going to figure this out in like 10 minutes. Uh, this might take a weekend away at the mountains or it might take a series of conversations with your spouse but it is a process and it's a never-ending process we're always listening to our lives asking ourselves is what I'm doing a reflection of who I am or am I climbing that ladder and it's actually leaning against the wrong wall but it's an important part of the process because I believe that activity always follows identity so if you want to go do something, you have to first ask yourself the question, who am I really? And, and that's how the process begins. I love that. And I love the, the clarity of the three questions. What do I love? What am I good at? And what is in demand? And you're going to review yep. your life. You're going to ask. I, I, what De I love Derek Sivers, by the way. His book, All You Want, oh, was yeah. terrific and inspirational for me. Mm -hmm. But it's not often obvious to us what we actually give to the world. Because right. we might take it for granted or we see it as something we love to do and, and fail to see the benefit it brings. So I love that advice of asking people who know us best, like, what is it we bring to the table? Um, mm -hmm. And getting maybe their perspective, um, because we have the curse of knowledge about that. And then what's yep. needed in the world. Does, do you have to have that last element? Does your calling have to be a profession? It doesn't I mean, have to be a That's a business question to me. Sure. It doesn't have to be a profession, uh, but I think it meets a real need. It has to meet a need. I, I believe that your calling is not like it's not your it's not my calling to play guitar. Like that's a hobby, right? I, I mean, you can think of these as uh, concentric. You can think of these as circles, kind of like a Venn diagram. Passion, skill, demand, and in the middle. And and there's lots of people who have done this. There's the sweet spot where all three of these meet. And if you want to build a business off of that, great. Not every uh, calling is going to be monetized or needs to be. Joy. The question uh, background about it being, you know, does it have to be a profession? But I also know that when we did our research, that most people found the deepest fulfillment in helping others, that there was always that element that yeah. it was not just for them, it was for other people. And I think that demand element might fill that blank. If there's no demand for it, it's just for you, and there's a little bit of hollowness to that maybe versus something that has more of a legacy attached to it. Yep, I completely agree. So if that's listening for your life, we have our first piece of homework. How do we move from there to accidental apprenticeships? Why is that step number two for you? 
because you can't do it on your own. So remember when I went home and my wife said, "Are you kidding me? You've been doing this for a long, long time." Uh, you know, like of course this, like this is what I've been saying to you for five years, and it's obvious to me. And I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, I, I guess I guess this is my thing." And what I realized is this idea of a self-made man or a self-made woman is a myth. People never succeed on their own. Uh, I, I learned through this process is that every story of success is really a story of community and that you're going to find a community of peers who help you get to where you want to go. I think it's popular this day and age to talk about mentorship. You need mentors, but nobody ever told me how to get a mentor. And I had many failed attempts at trying to find an older gentleman who would guide me and shepherd me through life. And some of those were great, and some of them were disappointing. Um, but I realized through that process that that's putting a lot of pressure on an individual. And the truth is that for most of us, uh, the worst way to go find a mentor is to just ask somebody to be your mentor. The best way is to recognize the mentors who are already in your life. Now that doesn't mean you can't go get mentored by some you know, leader or a person that you look up to or somebody who can help you do X, Y, or Z. It also doesn't mean that if you're you know, in, in the middle of uh, Kansas or uh, North Korea or wherever you are in the world and you feel like you don't have access to somebody who can help guide you, that you aren't out of luck because most mentorships uh, are basically a multitude of mentors. It is a communal process. I learned this by interviewing all these people and realizing that it wasn't, they didn't do it on their own and it was never just one person who helped them. Thinking again about the hero's journey, you got to have a guide. You got to have an Obi-Wan Kenobi who helps you gain clarity about the, about the calling itself and helps you figure out the next steps in the process. You know, to, to stretch our Star Wars analogy out even more, and if you if you don't understand this, then you need to, like your homework assignment is just go watch Star Wars. <laughs> but even Luke Skywalker, the hero, He's got Yoda, he's got Obi-Wan, he has a multitude of mentors. And, and the truth is that uh, Paulo Coelho says this, and I, I love this, he says, when you start moving in the direction of your life's calling, the universe conspires to uh, help you become a success. And I think that's true. I mean, if that's a little woo-woo for you, I just think the practical part of it is that when you start chasing a passion, that is inspiring. That is energizing to people around you and friends and family members. Not everybody. You'll have people who are you know, enemies to your purpose. They don't want you to do it. Uh, but you will have people who want to see you succeed and are willing to um, help you kind of find the way. The, the biggest example that I can think of is Steve Jobs. Here, here is like our picture of a self-made man. And yet here's a guy who didn't know exactly what he wanted to do in life and had many people help him get to where he wanted to go. Some people don't realize that um, you know, he, he uh, went to college and couldn't afford to stay at Reed College, didn't really think it made sense for his parents to pay all this money at this expensive school that he didn't really want to be at. So he drops out and he starts auditing classes. He audits a calligraphy class. Then he leaves that, he goes and works for Atari, uh, gets you know, kind of mentored in this unconventional way there, learns about building things, meets, you know, Steve Wozniak, who he kind of partners with. But there's all these people, and, and he mentions this in his kind of famous speech about the looking back and the dots uh, are connecting. The dots are people. They're the community that surrounds you to help you get to where you want to go. You cannot get there on your own. And so the practical thing that you need to be doing as you start listening to your life Start looking around for accomplices, for people who can help you. And, and this isn't you know, some exercise in trying to take from people. It's just who, what's the team that I can get around this thing? Who are the people that I can start learning from? And I would suggest that for you it begins here. Like this is part of your mentorship, learning from people online, through books, from afar, and then also finding people locally that you can get into community with or you know, get on Skype once a week with somebody or in a Facebook group or something. I mean, technology makes this uh, so easy these days to get around like-minded people who can encourage you to where you want to go. But make no mistake, every story of success is really a story of community. I love that. I mean, Obi-Wan works for me. We just showed our kids the Karate Kid. So like, you know, I had Mr. Yeah. Miyagi in my head when I was yeah. reading this. Um, and you, you take issue with the statement, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. 
And if I'm hearing you correctly, I mean, the way maybe to look at that is the moment you know you're headed to Detroit, like, let's just pretend like that's your calling, right? Mm-hmm. You start noticing other people who are from Detroit. And that becomes only so logical that you might talk to them and say, what's Detroit like? You know, what's your favorite restaurant in Detroit? And so there might be this series of people that becomes obvious because you have picked a direction. And Mm -hmm. I I love that because, you know, I don't, I can't look back and like in terms of listening to my life, there was no road to the Damascus moment, right? There wasn't this horrible life event, um, but there was a series of small things and my whole writer thing, you know, is in a little restaurant here in Austin where a guy who'd never published a word, I was introduced to him as a writer, even though he'd never written anything. And it was, I just got stuck on how can he call himself a writer? And I was talking to my wife and she's like, there's my mentor right in the car with me. It's like, it's not what your profession is. It's what you're called to do. And it's like, after that, I just completely like looked at titles and everything differently. And my identity changed. And so like, these things don't happen the way they do in the movies necessarily. So we don't necessarily have the, the big event. We don't necessarily want the big bad event like happened to Garrett, but we have a choice to learn from our life nonetheless. And we have can have many mentors instead of one amazing one. I mean, it would all be great to have that, but yeah, they're there. They're there all around us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And whether or not you have the big event, um, like that's, kind of irrelevant. I believe we all have moments in life where we go, oh, I get it. You know, like you you have that conversation with your wife. I had a conversation with my wife. Spouses are great at this. Wives especially. Husbands, you know, maybe we could up our game a little bit. Uh, But um, what matters more than the big moment is the next hundred moments that come after that. The small but steady steps that you take in the direction somewhere. And I describe finding your calling not as a plan that you follow, but as a path that you walk on. If you've ever walked on a path, you know, up in the mountains somewhere or hiking somewhere, uh, anything that's not like a sidewalk, uh, you don't know where it goes. You can only see so far before there's some curve or bend down the road. And your job isn't to worry about, well, what's at the end of this path? Uh, Your job is to worry about what's my next step and getting people around you who can walk with you on that. Some of them are going to look like Mr. Miyagi. They're going to look like formal mentors. Some of them are going to be peers, but you're going to learn something from them that you can take and apply to the journey. And so the student in that respect is never ready, but mentors, teachers are all around you. You just have to recognize them. Cool. All right. Well, so we can, I want to make sure that folks, if you have a question that we can put in front of Jeff, I've got about four flagged here right now please go ahead and type it into the questions toolbar. We've got a, a few minutes before we transition to the Q&A. But Jeff, why don't we action, right? I think that leads us to the third point you wanted to bring up. It's not the third step necessarily in your book, but pivot points is about kind of maybe something that happens while you're taking those steps along the path. Can you walk us through that? Sure. So a pivot point is what happens when the plan, the idea, the thing that you thought was the dream fails. So one of the things that was really interesting to me about all these people that I talk to, and each chapter in the book follows a different person's journey. So in listening to your life, I talk about my friend Jody Nolan, who at 58 years old found her calling. And and her like life's message is it's never too late. And she realized that everything leading up to that moment was not wasted. It was preparation. Uh, Or I met Ginny Pong, who was the first doula, a birth coach, in Singapore. And she had all these things happen to her that were were not great. And and she was kind of out on her own. I mean, she is the picture of self-made success. And yet, when you dig a little bit deeper, you find this network of people who helped her get to where she wanted to go. And she was smart enough at the time to recognize those people and not push them away, which is sometimes what we do when we're really driven to uh, succeed. And then, you know, this this third part of the process is, okay, so you've, you know, you have an idea of what you want to do. You're moving in the direction. You get that you need a team or some mentors, uh, whatever that looks like to you. You understand that you can't do it alone. And then what do you do when you fail? And I found that failure um, was the most common ingredient in these stories of success. And again, success is not millions and millions of dollars, although some people had very profitable, successful businesses. Um, It is doing meaningful work. 
it's doing something that you love and you feel like if I keep doing this for the rest of my life, whether it's my profession or not, like I can die a happy man, I can die a happy woman. So what happens when you fail? I think that our understanding of failure typically is, um, you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And W.C. Field says this quote about that. He says, if it, at first you don't succeed, um, then quit because there's no use being a damn fool about it. And I think there's. <laughs> you guys there's my some, quotes. He, he's great. Um, there's some truth to that. Sometimes you need to not keep trying the same thing, and and so we're going to talk a, a, about that. That's when you fail. That is an opportunity. It is a pivot point. If you're unfamiliar with that analogy in basketball, there's a move called a pivot where you know if you're dribbling down the court and then for whatever reason you stop, you can't keep dribbling again because that's traveling. You're gonna. It's called a double dribble, uh, and so you stop and you're out of moves. And let's say you stop and you're too far away from you know the 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 basket, so you can't make a shot. You've got somebody in your face. You're out of options. You're done except for one move called a pivot, which means that if you have one foot planted, you can use the other uh, foot, you can move in any direction, 360 degrees, you can't move forward or backwards, but you can move in any direction and then pass the ball to a teammate. So when you fail, it is an opportunity to change direction. And uh, my favorite example of this is the founder of Groupon. His name is Andrew Mason, and some people don't know that uh, Groupon started out as a nonprofit organization. They used social media basically to vote on service projects that they would do, and it failed. It failed horribly. They lost a million dollars in the first year, and they're getting ready to shut it down when one of the investors said, What if we use all this technology to try to make money, to try to sell something? So they called up some local uh, uh, you know, stores in Chicago and said, Hey, if we can get 100 people to buy, you know, to agree to buy whatever widget you're selling, can you give us a 20% discount? And they said, sure. And that's how Groupon was born. And $13 billion later, that was a pretty profitable pivot. And so what we learn about failure is it is not the thing that keeps you from success. It is the thing that leads you there if you understand how to learn from failure, how to use it as feedback. And, and, and the feedback is never... You should have done that. You're a bad, bad person. Because if you, if Andrew Mason never failed with this nonprofit organization called The Point, we never would have had Groupon. So failure is the requirement. It is the thing that you have to get through to get to where you want to go. And every failure can teach you something. And when you hit a failure, the question is, okay, what can I do differently next time? How do I pivot? Because you, because typically you're not going to do the same thing over and over again and then succeed. You're going to change something about the way you approach the goal and you can use the failure as feedback to learn lessons and then apply it to the next attempt. But I just find so much encouragement in all of these successful people, they all failed a lot. And it's not, it's not that the failure, it's not that they succeeded in spite of their failure. They succeeded because of it, because they understood how to use failure to succeed. And if you have that same understanding about failure, that it's a pivot point, it's not the end, you're not done, it is the thing that you have to go through to get to where you want to go, um, you're going to succeed too. Uh, it's inspirational stuff. Let me ask you a question. And folks, we've got about seven or eight questions rolling in. Definitely let us have your questions. We're about to transition to the Q&A portion here. You talk about pivot points, and you're using the example of someone who realized that they were slightly off target, right? That they had to right. pivot into a new direction. We also hear stories about people who powered through failure in the same direction. How do we know when it's a pivot? Like we look around and we go keep going the same direction versus we need to change or do we ever get the gift of that kind of clarity? It's a great question. You know, um, I think that when you fail, you need to ask yourself a few questions. Was this the wrong thing? Like, was it just the, like it was? I, I I was wrong. I had the wrong idea. In the case of Groupon, it was the wrong thing. Another question is, was it the wrong time? Uh, it it you know like there are plenty of ideas that at first fail and then later succeed. Uh, and and there's lots of interesting 
research about what are called genius clusters where at like innovation doesn't happen iteratively year after year things get better and better and better throughout history uh, moments of innovation and insight and creativity they happen in these clusters when all of these things are just at the right moment in time what is that Victor Hugo quote there's nothing like an idea whose time has come so sometimes it's just the wrong time and you need to wait or or do something else while that you know that idea kind of uh, matures. Uh, this is true with writing books. I've found like sometimes you just you can't force it. You have to just wait on it a little bit. Uh, other than the third question, when you fail, is um, was it the wrong approach? So I am suspicious. I'm not saying that this doesn't happen, but I am suspicious when somebody says I failed and then I just kept trying and trying and trying until I succeeded. Typically, that's not true. Typically, um, they're not trying it the same way at the same time, you know, with the same amount of effort. Like they're failing and they're going, well, what did I do wrong? Okay, maybe if I try it this way or I say it this way, then she'll buy or, you know, then I'll be able to do this. And um, like I, I did this with my wife. I, you know, I, I started, I started, you know, uh, um, wanting to date her, trying to date her, did not work, and I failed. And I was like, Okay. All right. What what I do differently, you know? And and so then I I wrote her a song and I played it, and she was kind of like ambivalent about it, and uh, and I was like, okay, what, you know? And I kept trying different things. I was trying the same thing, but I was trying it lots of different ways until I finally found a way to succeed. And so I think those are the three questions that you can ask: um, Is this the wrong thing? Is it the wrong time? Or is this just the wrong approach? And if you know, it, and the answers will help you understand whether or not you have to pivot to something completely different. Or do what I call that's an external pivot. An internal pivot is changing the the way that you approach it. I love that answer because I do think that there is this. I know that persistence is important, but yep. I think people misread it sometimes for being just stubborn. And I'm going to do it. It's my right. way or the highway. You know, I have this vision, and it's exactly right from the beginning. And I just don't think that's true to any of the entrepreneurs I've had the privilege to interview. That there were they were iterative iterative mm -hmm. and sometimes they struggle to tell you how they subtly change their approaches it just yeah. but it is part of the process it is well i'm going to open it up any before i turn it over to the questions here any final words of wisdom for folks i mean um i love the practicality you know of listening to your life to to go back and ask what you love what are you good at what's in demand to start looking for mentors and to start maybe paying attention to our mistakes in a different way. Not that they say something about us, but that they might be leading us to a clearer path, right? I think I, we actually have a quote. Someone asks you, I'm going to try to quote you. You correct me. Failure is not what kept successful people from success. It's what actually led them to success. Is that correct? Yeah. Failure isn't what prevents you from success. It's what leads you there. There we go. Any, any final words of wisdom to cap this off? Yeah, just real quick, Jay, because um, I talk to so many people about this, and this is you know why you write a book because there you know there's enough questions out there that the book is hopefully the best answer for it. Um, but there is this idea, and if there's one takeaway from the book, I think it's this: um, there's this idea that I need to wait for clarity before I take action on my calling, and that's not true. There's this story about a journalist who goes to visit Mother Teresa. And he asks her to pray for him, which is what I would ask Mother Teresa to do for me. And he says, pray that I would have clarity. He needs direction in his life, and he doesn't know what to do next. And he said, Mother Teresa, can you pray for me that I could have clarity? And she says, no, I will not do that. And he's like, what do you mean? You're Mother Teresa. Like, why, why can't you do that? And she goes, because I've never had clarity. And he's like, your mother, you, you never had clarity. You're Mother Teresa. Like, if you don't have your life figured out, what does that mean for the rest of us? She, she said, oh, no, I've never had clarity. I've only ever had trust. And I will pray that you have trust. We all want clarity before we're willing to act. But the truth is that clarity comes with action. And the best thing that, that I think you could do at the end of this is to go take one small step. Maybe it's sending an email to 10 friends and saying, hey, what's something that's obvious to me that maybe I don't realize about myself? Maybe it just starts with that awareness step of listening to your life. But the best thing to do is to take some kind of action because that's where the clarity comes. You don't figure all of this out and know exactly what's going to happen next. All these people that I talked to who quote unquote had clarity, I said, what's the next step? 
like you know where are you at in the process do you, like is this, is this the end of the journey do you feel like you've arrived and all of them said no I have no idea uh, it, it, like they were in the process and looking back there was clarity but looking forward it was still foggy and they knew that they had to take the next step clarity comes with action okay Jeff that's awesome and I love that you told the mother Teresa story I actually repeated that um, in our stand-up meeting for my 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 team, so I thought that was so oh. significant. I love that she's yeah. like, "No, I won't pray for that." I just like it's hard for me to imagine <laughs> that from the little nun yeah. from Calcutta. Um, yeah. But there she was because there was wisdom. I want to yeah. rapidly. We've got about five minutes or so. I've got some good questions in here. Right. Um, can someone have more than one calling? So in the book, we didn't talk about this, but I talk about this thing called the portfolio life, and I borrow that idea from a. Uh, management, business management philosopher named Charles Handy who wrote this book, The Age of Unreason. And uh, in that book, he talks about how in the future, which he wrote this in 1989, so like now, <laughs> uh, he said, um, we're all going to have portfolio careers where we do more than one thing. And he talks about five different types of work. So in short, I think of a calling not as one thing that you do, even the one thing is this way, it's not one thing forever, it's one thing that you can do right now and it's th you know, thinking about how do you optimize your life in terms of priorities to ultimately get to you know, the goal. But it's many things and for me a calling is a portfolio of activities that um, uh, again hit that sweet spot of doing what you love doing what you're good at or getting good at it uh, and, and that ultimately contributes to the world's need in some way. And um, so I don't think you're going to have multiple callings. You will have new activities and new information throughout your life that get to contribute to the portfolio folio, and the calling grows over time. I, I love that answer because I found that the writing itch I felt can sometimes be satisfied through teaching and other things. Right. And yeah. I start to look at them in that portfolio way. So that, that question, we can thank Wendy for that question. Rhonda asks, have you found any commonalities regarding spirituality and reaching the point of accepting your search for purpose? In other words, do you think we can find our purpose if we haven't reached a specific point in our spiritual growth? That's a good question. Uh, so this word calling has certain, I mean, for some people it has religious connotations. Uh, I have a spiritual attachment to it, but I wrote this book and I use that word because I found that my church-going friends, my non-church-going friends, everybody was talking this way in terms of the work that they were doing or they would like to be doing. We, we are thinking of what we do, our work in the world, whether that's a job or not. You're working in the world. You're doing things. Um, we want to think of it as a calling, at least at, at this period in human history. So what's fascinating to me about that is everybody that I talk to, um, uh, they understood their process like it was it felt spiritual in the sense that um, uh, you know listening to your life there was sort of this like I didn't you know I didn't know what I wanted to do but then this thing happened and I realized oh gosh this is this is what I'm supposed to do and some people attributed that voice to God or an internal voice in themselves but there was there was a depth to it uh, I don't think that anybody had to reach reach some sort of level of spirituality before they found their calling. Uh, I think that everybody has a calling, and I think that you can realize that calling uh, with or without you know reaching a certain level of spirituality. Um, but I think exploring both of them personally for myself in tandem, I mean that's that is a healthy process to follow. I hope that helps and makes sense. I think that was great, and you're you're walking that line, I, and I hear it, and it's. I actually think that, that finding your calling is a spiritual journey. It doesn't have to be a religious one. That's up to the person in question. So I, right. like, I like the way you phrased it quite well. I want to get a couple more of these um, before we sure. run out of time. We've got a couple of minutes, so these might have to be rapid fire. Okay. Um, someone was saying they're wanting to do this exercise of reflecting back on the moments when they were happy, and they just can't think of times that they were doing things that made them very happy. Now what? Well, first of all, I'm so sorry to hear that, um, but I understand. Um, second of all, uh, you know, some of us have lots of happy memories and some of us don't. Um, I would begin by uh, asking uh, maybe parents or friends or family members, when was the last time you saw me happy? Uh, I would start there. I'm not saying that 
uh, you know, some of those relationships may be good or not good. Uh, so, but I'd find somebody who knows you and ask them, well, when was the last time you saw me happy? Because you may just not remember it. Uh, second, if you just can't think of anything, then ask yourself, well, what would make me happy? You know, what did I do today that made me uh, unhappy? And, you know, do the opposite of that, or at least consider what the opposite of that might be. Like I said, some of us have had horrible things happen to us. Your past doesn't dictate your future, but it can inform it. If you don't have any happy memories, then ask yourself a question, well, like, what made me unhappy? And that is definitely what you should, like, that, that shouldn't be a part of your calling, and you can start ruling things out. Yeah, eliminating past is getting you closer to finding one. I love that's a tough question. I wanted to ask it because there was a lot of heart mm -hmm. in the longer. It was longer than I read. Another yeah. one, a fifty-three year old. This will be the last question. Um, and if folks want to find Jeff, um, you can go to his website. He is on Twitter. He's on stuff. If you want to read more about his book, if you go to the one thing dot com slash Jeff Goins. It'll take you to an offer he's currently got going on where you can get his book for two ninety nine, dollars folks. That's actually how some of our staff got it so that we could prep for this call. So definitely check it out. So I don't want to say the name of this individual. They've been down this path. They've had a lot of failures. And this lady expressed that she, she was losing her confidence at 53 that she was going to find it. What do you suggest for someone to help them regain their confidence so that they can keep going down this path? One of the things that I was encouraged by when I set out to do this project where I you know, interviewed all these people and did all this research, and I, I realized it was a little bit presumptuous for somebody in his mid-30s to tell you know, people at all stages of life what you should do with your life. So I intentionally sought out wisdom, and one of those people that I mentioned earlier is Jody Noland, who found her calling at 58 years old. Um, and had a bunch of failure and heartache happen to her. Uh, she walked away from you know her calling at one point and then had a community of people saying, no, you've got to do this. What she told me is this, if you are alive, if you have breath in your lungs, you're not done. And, and I like to give it like this, you're not done until you're dead. You have more to contribute, more to give. I once had a friend tell me, well, maybe my calling was just to have my kids and they're going to go do great things. I love that. That's a wonderful thing. That's a selfless thing to say. But if you're not dead, you're not done. There's more for you to do. And I'm not saying it's easy. That's, I think that's uh, a myth about finding your calling is it's somehow going to be easy or effortless. That's not true. It could be hard and painful, but it will also be purposeful. And given the belief between I don't have a purpose, I don't have it, it's too hard, I can't do it, and audaciously hoping that there's more, I choose, I choose hope, and I, I hope you do too. All right, so I just want to point out that the writer has a typo. I don't know how The Art of War instead of The Art of Work showed up there, but his book is called The Art of Work, <laughs> and bringing that artful fulfillment to your work, not war. Um, little typo. I apologize for not catching that beforehand, but someone, thank you to our listeners who pointed that out for me. Jeff, um, thank you so, so much for sharing your wisdom. And I'll tell you, for someone who is where you are in life, you've got plenty to offer, and I love your humility on it. Um, it's an important topic. Hopefully, people will take the homework you've suggested and start taking some steps to getting a little bit more clarity, whether it's just eliminating things they know they don't love, or maybe identifying some things that will bring them closer to fulfillment. So I just want to wholeheartedly say thank you. This initiated a wonderful conversation with my 10-year-old daughter where I asked her, hey, Veronica, how do you think you find your calling? And mm -hmm. how great to start having those conversations earlier with our kids so that it's not something that we look up and we're having a midlife crisis, right? So thank you for that personally. And thank you on behalf of everyone here. Folks, um, yeah. any final words? They can go to jeffcoins.com and get the art of work. I hope they will. Um, anything else, Jeff? No, thanks. Um, that, this was great, Jay, and I, I, again, appreciate it. Thank you guys for letting me be a part of this. And um, if you have any questions, if you got anything out of this, you can reach out to me on Twitter, at Jeff Goins. And if there's any questions that I didn't answer, I'd be happy to answer those. There. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Everybody, our next one's going to be on June 29th. You talk about someone who has a life event. John O'Leary um, has written a great book about setting your life on fire. When he was eight years old, he was burnt over 98% of his body. And he has come back and has a real inspirational message to share for us in the same vein, vein of what we've talked about with Jeff, but it's going to be first person and it should be very enlightening for all of us. 
Um, and just to reiterate what Jeff just said, he has generously offered up his Twitter handle. If you've got questions, go reach out to him there. Um, I personally found him responsive there and active. Um, thank you for following The One Thing, and we will see you next month, folks.